Winchester, Massachusetts. A suburban town north of Boston is known for its school system and its sunny town center. But within its 21,000 residents, our town also contains an incredible archive of history and memories, much of which is unknown to today's youth. Hundreds of our residents have lived through a world war, have undergone hardship and sorrow, and have persevered through the worst. In honor of the anniversary of the Second World War, we have invited some of them to share their stories with us. For America, the war began on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese army sent hundreds of fighter planes to attack Pearl Harbor. This event marked not only tragic loss of human lives, but the beginning of wartime in America. On that Sunday, uh, uh, I was out with a walk with one of my cousins, and we're walking around, the weather was rather nippy, it started to snow a little bit, and it was very overcast, obviously, and that's when the war began. That's when Pearl Harbor was bombed. In 1941, when the war started, I was in the movies with my buddy. In 1941, December 7th, I come out, we saw in the newspaper the headlines, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. I said, let's go in and join the Marines. We had the music on, the car radio, listening to good Sunday morning music. And all of a sudden, they broke in with the announcement of the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And you know, when you're a kid, you don't always really, I didn't really understand what it was, but I knew how big and how awful it was by the expression on the grown-ups' faces. Uh, my initial response, I suppose, was like a lot of people. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that we had been attacked. I knew there were negotiations going on between the president and the people in Japan, but I couldn't believe that it was a, an attack and that it was as devastating as it was. I was in second grade and we all went to school that day and talked about it in the classroom and everybody was talking about that and everybody was kind of scared as to what was going to happen. I was eight years old and my brother, who was a year older, came running in the house on a Sunday afternoon saying the Japanese have Pearl, bombed Pearl Harbor. And my mother said, where is Pearl Harbor? My memories were that, as a young child, was there was always a war. I mean, I don't remember before there was a war. It meant, my husband knew when we heard about it, that this meant that now he could no longer be states, stateside at the Marine Corps barracks in Washington. Now he would certainly be sent into action, and he was. After America entered the war, over 16 million were sent away to both Europe and the Pacific Ocean. As they endured brutal combat on both fronts, those at home were left to pray and hope for their safe return. Two brothers, two sisters. My two brothers went and my sister went. There were two uncles that died in the Russian front. My brother went in the service and uh, initially trained in Sampson, New York and then went into, um, they were uh, ships that were patrolling the East Coast. And uh, his ship was in the Armada that was in uh, D-Day. I had uh, two cousins and one was in the uh, army. He was uh, a paratrooper and the other one was in the Navy. And uh, they were both Kenneth, the, the naval officer, was uh, torpedoed in the Mediterranean, but his life was saved, as he said, because he could swim. He was on the HMS Snapdragon, I think, and the other one was a, a paratrooper, and I've forgotten the details of his life, but they both survived. So I was very lucky. Um, my husband was very active in the Marine Corps. He served on Saipan, Tinian, Iwo Jima, and he enlisted from Medford. I was a senior in high school, and a gentleman came who was in the V-5 program and gave us a talk and 
the way he t mentioned it, I became very enamored with the idea of being in the Naval Aviation Program. I always wanted to fly, and I thought, why not? He did get the Silver Star for valentry and, uh, and bravery and action. What he did is he launched flamethrowers during the war. Uh, that was um, something where you had to go in ahead of the enemy lines because they had a short distance before explosion. So they'd have to creep in the night and get ahead and launch the flamethrower for it to reach the enemy. And that was, I said, why did you volunteer to do anything like that so dangerous? You know, I'm scolding him back home. But um, he, they all wanted to do their part and, and certainly did. My sister was an army nurse. And uh, when she joined, she was kind of wondering how my father was gonna take it. But she had to tell him anyway. And she, she told him, and he said, I'm proud of you. She was stationed on New Caledonia. Then, as the war pro pro went on, she went to Okinawa. And then that's the last place she went to. And then she came back. I'm on the Sports Hall of Fame at Mass Maritime. Baseball, basketball, and football. I, I played against the Army, Navy, JV's down in Annapolis and West Point. I am going to talk about my father, Wayne Myrick. Um, during the uh, war in, in the Navy, he actually worked in, uh, in engineering as far as uh, ships, heating systems, and then continued to do the same thing after the war. During the time uh, that he was in the war. He, he, I think he was on seven ships, according to his discharge papers. Uh, mainly the Japanese in the Pacific, in the area of Guadalcanal, um, that was pretty much it. Um, then he was in Nagasaki at the, after the war was finished, or the Japanese surrendered and the, I think it was about 15 days after the bomb had been um, set on Nagasaki and they were he was on a hospital ship at that point and they were supposed to uh, process the POWs who came who had been in Japan during the war and I think that was the most traumatic experience for him um, and, and talking about the condition of the POWs who were brought out of Japan at that time. But he talked about the actual battle experience and, and the loss of friends, shipmates. Um, Pearl Harbor, he was on the United USS Blue, which actually did get out of the harbor. And he then was put on another ship, the Endicott, which um, was in the English Channel for D-Day, but it, there was so much traffic in the channel at that time there were a few, if you want to call them, fender benders. The Endicott was damaged he, and had to be brought in to be repaired in Ireland. They did, somehow or another, they must have just circumnavigated the world for wherever they were needed. Three of us, I was the second oldest, three of us were in World War II. My oldest brother was a tail gunner in the Navy, a Navy fighter. I was in the Merchant Marine in the Navy Reserves. My other brother was on a destroyer. And then later on, a couple of years later, I had another brother who was a tank commander in Korea. So, we paid our dues. <laughs> I had four uncles who were in service at the time of the war. My uncle Doug was a Navy doctor during World War II. He was on Okinawa during the invasion of, of Okinawa. 
and he found an abandoned truck during the battle and cleaned it all up with some of his buddies and the Marines and made an operating room out of it. He was kind of the family hero. I remember we as family <coughs> wrote uh, airmail messages. And what it was, was it's very, very light. It was a piece of paper that you wrote the message on and then you fold it up and it made it into an envelope. You stuck it and you mailed it. Yes, V mail they called it. Victory, I think. V was for victory. We always had V for victory. And they were little letters that were photographed and if they said anything that was about where they were stationed, it was blacked out and it was very secret. He said um, that when they arrived in Nagasaki, there was total de devastation. The only thing that could be seen were former blacksmith, blacksmith and machine shops. They were, they were metal, I guess, so they survived. Um, he talks about the, some of the POWs who came out had little wooden boxes and they would say that was the remains of their brother or their neighbor or their best friend. And um, I guess there were just thousands and thousands of these boxes that had to be uh, brought back to, um, the, to the United States. The Battle of the Bulge, my brother Ted was involved in. He was in Signal Corps and his job I found out later after the Army when he came back was to, um, he and a partner were in a Jeep with a big long coil of wire. And when the Army advanced, today you have um, uh, radio through the air, but in those days you had wire. So his job was to go up to the enemy lines, and I thought this was absurd when I heard it later, and wire and locate where he was going to put a, a wire and then get the hell out of there so we could get caught, come back and go to another part of the front. And then when the military, when the army got that point, they'd find the, the location, they'd wire in and they'd had telephones. And that was his job. And he, he had lost one partner through death. He was never wounded, but his other partner was wounded once. And uh, so he came out of it unscathed physically, but he was an emotional wreck when he got home. So he spent a year, now he just got out of high school and he went into the military that summer. So he was like a 17 year old kid. By the time he came back, he was probably 21 or 22, max. Um, yeah, he went in 41. And so uh, he came back and he was just a nervous wreck. So my parents suggested that he just do some physical work. In those days, you didn't have psychiatrists saying what to do with these these military that came back from the war. And he, I remember, spent almost a year chopping wood in a forest outside of Concord, New Hampshire. And he did it for a purpose of really cutting it for the fireplaces and so on, for the whole neighborhood, not just ours. And I remember as a kid going up, by this time I was 11 and 12, and he, I helped him chop wood, but I can remember that. And that, that, I think that helped him. And then a year after that, he went to a postgraduate school at Holderness, New Hampshire, at Holderness, college. Then he went to college after that. I had an uncle who was, um, he was single and he was 35 and he, he thought he was beyond the draft but he wasn't. So he went into the um, army and he went into what was then called the Signal Corps and ultimately um, he uh, served in Australia and uh, he was we thought it was very important that he receive the uh, telegram uh, because he was doing wireless to be transmitted to Douglas MacArthur that um, the Japanese had surrendered. This is the helmet that my husband wore in the war. And uh, these were Japanese cigarettes that he uh, brought back. And they've been all these years sitting in a drawer upstairs. <laughs> I bet they taste horrible now. When he was in the Pacific, um, when he had a free moment, he 
had gathered some shells and made me this shell necklace. I had one brother who had gone to the military. Another one was in the Air Force, and he was really wounded very badly. So I, he, I think when he was like 23, uh, he was the older brother. When he was 23, he was so wounded that he had to have one lung removed and a quarter and a third of the other lung. Uh, my, my brother Ted, and he, I, I can remember <clears throat> when he was shipped out, in New York, the Army gave every soldier one minute to talk to their parents or loved ones. And I can remember around the telephone, my mother and father were there, and my brother and myself and my sisters, and my parents and my older sisters were crying. And I didn't quite understand why, because I was, by this time, I was probably six or seven. And I was proud that my brother was going to go to war. And of course they were crying because they thought that he might never come back. I had a cousin who was in the army um, in Europe, and he was killed in the Battle of the Bulge. And I remember his, one of his bu army buddies came later to talk to his parents and said, you know, it was such a terrible thing that he was killed, but he said, you'll be, I'm sure you'll be happy to know he was killed because the guy in front of him had fallen, and Teddy tried to help him instead of just moving ahead and getting out of the way. And he was hit. The, the window facing the sidewalk of your home, if you had men or women in the military, you'd have one star. It was a blue star because they were alive. One star for every son or daughter. My parents had three stars, and we proudly presented it in our living room window. Now, I was in grade school, so every time I came home from school, every single day, I, because I always heard about Gold Star, and Gold Star meant you were dead or missing. And so every day I remember coming around a particular corner when I could just see the, the, the three blue stars. And when I saw blue, I went, whew, and I went home, and I never told my parents about this. I never told my older brothers and sisters that I was very worried, <clears throat> but it never turned gold. For that, I was very happy. We were always afraid when there was a knock on the door, you never wanted a telegram edged in black. It, that would be a sign somebody had died. So it was sort of awesome to even answer a door. But I can remember the greatest anxiety I had was coming around that corner looking to see if those blue stars were still blue. In fact, I can almost cry when I think about it. There were so many ifs in your mind, things would happen so far away, you weren't absolutely sure what was going on all the time. We lost a lot of our boys, as everybody did. And the, boy, the people that had the gold stars in their windows show, showed them proudly, the gold star mothers. And, uh, uh, and you knew somebody from, uh, say you'd heard about in high school that had been drafted that didn't come home. We were lived on a, on a state highway. We lived on Route 6 in a town west of Providence. And there were army convoys going all the time. You'd see these trucks of three or four or ten trucks taking servicemen to their next wherever they were supposed to be, the next post base they were going to. And just real, just these endless convoys of young men going by. And my mother's two brothers had been in World War II and World War I, and they both came home. But she felt so strongly, you know, here are these young men going, and many of them going to their death. And she stood out in the front yard looking at these trucks, thinking, I can't bear this. I I've got to do something. I really can't bear it. Uh, the, the bulk of people that went to war and fought in those front lines were 18, 19, and 20 years old. Uh, it was a hard fact of life, and it, it certainly uh, uh, was a tough way to learn about life. Oh, de oh yes. Specifically, the most, in t most specifically, the men who went in overseas and, and, and did what they did. I mean, I can't imagine it. I just can't imagine it. Soldiers weren't the only ones at risk during the war. Those on the eastern coast were facing enemy threats of their own, with every family preparing themselves for the worst. 
the immediate concern was the security of Boston Harbor. Now the risk being to make sure that the German submarines did not uh, uh, penetrate the harbor and uh, you know, destroy part of the city because the subs were right offshore at that time. We had to be careful on our waterfront in case there were submarines out there. I don't know there ever were, but we had to be sure that, that we were not aiding them in any way to find out where we, where the shore was. So if that, that siren came out from Biggs and Cobbs, that meant we were to shut the windows and be quiet. I had a sister in civil defense, and I remember she had a helmet with a CD thing on it, and uh, she would, she had assigned tasks of going to the local fire tower. So those towers were high, so there was always a way to get up, and so civil defense people would go up there and watch for airplanes, watch for any occurrence that might happen, and that's what, that's what their job was. My mother was an airplane spotter, which meant that she went up, she took her two little girls, and we went up to a shack up on a country road about three miles from our house. And they had a chart of all the German warplanes. And you were supposed to be able to identify if you saw anything, that's a Messerschmitt, that's a this, this is that. And you would then, we had a telephone, and you were then to call in and say, there's an enemy airplane overhead on such and such a road at such and such a time. If she heard a noise, you know, then we would get up and look. And of course, we were little. You know, my sister was only about three and I was six. And so we, big excitement, oh, there's a plane overhead. And she'd look at the chart and then figure, I don't think it's anything other than just the, the ordinary mail plane going over or something like that. I remember what you did is at, when you were in elementary school, for some reason, when there was an alarm, there was a civil defense officer who made the alarm in the town. And they went and they did it through the, um, the local fire station whistle and there was a certain whistle number, boom, 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 or whatever it was, and that meant air raid. And it was anticipated that someday some air raids might come over uh, the United States. So we'd jump under our desks, I remember that. And then if you were home, you were told to go into a basement. I can remember that so distinctly, and that went on a lot. I do remember also that we had to have blackout curtains on our windows, and if you had lights on at night, there were people that would knock on your door and say, turn those lights off. You can see those because they were afraid, if you lived on the coast, that maybe German U-boats, German boats that patrolled up and down the coast, might see those and, and attack. And I remember my grandmother <laughs> sewing up curtains for all the windows in the house to put up like a screen at night. Air raid wardens who were volunteers, Winchester volunteers, would walk up and down the, the streets and if they saw a crack in the window, they'd go and ask you to turn the light out. I can remember all the cars, the top half of the headlights were painted black. A, I mean, you had to have some light in order to drive, but they wanted to make sure it uh, didn't go up. You bought shades that were absolutely black, and then you, in your own home, when you pulled the shade down, of course there were cracks and light could get through. So you built a small piece of wood, which was like, uh, you know, a half inch by half inch, and you tacked it on the inside of the, of the jam and on the outside of the, of the shade. So when you pulled it down, the, the cracks were, were covered up by those pieces of wood. So it was absolutely blackout, absolutely blackout. Everything was totally black. And that happened a lot. The threat of invasion wasn't the only thing on the minds of Americans at home. Daily life during the 1940s became a war effort of its own. I think I remember the rationing very well during the war. Uh, <laughs> most all food products were rationed. Uh, <laughs> uh, butter, meat in particular, sugar, coffee. And there was rationing of um, shoes. There was rationing of food, some foods. There was rationing of um, clothing, some clothing. And all of those uh, savings were for the war effort. We used to go down to the basement of the elementary school every week to be given our little stamps that we put in our ration books. You know, when you get your sheet and 
of, of X many stamps and paste them in that you could then take to the grocery store. And I remember our local grocery store, our local butcher said, whatever kind of meat we get here, I'm grinding it all up. The only thing anybody gets is hamburger. It doesn't matter whether it was a, would have been a good roast or a good steak. I can't cope with it any other way. You're entitled to three pounds of meat for the week and you're getting Hamburg. And uh, we, that's what we did. It was very precious to have uh, sugar. And my mother loved to bake, so she was really, oh, where can I get some more sugar? Where can I get some more sugar? <laughs> so. My father gave us a banana, and he said, well, this is the last banana you'll see until the end of the war, and it was. We didn't see another banana for several years. And I can remember as a kid, my assigned task was to take this thing, which was really like white lard, with a color, fake color to it, and it was in a plastic thing. And you bought it, it was a nice cube and so on. And then you had to mix it up in order for the color to make it look like butter. And I remember that was Charlie's task as a 10-year-old, go mash this thing up, and then try to straighten out, put it in the refrigerator, get it cold, and you used it in lieu of butter. And in Germany, everything was rationed, you know, you couldn't, sugar, you could only get about 100 grams of sugar a month, a month. That's less than a quarter pound. Butter was impossible, meat was impossible. And I remember that, you know, because we always were hungry. As kids. Even beyond food rationing and blackouts, every community found ways in which they could aid in the war effort, all fighting for a united cause of victory on the home front. The whole country was mobilized, and I guess it was the political leadership that, that permitted that to happen. Nobody went off to college and had a good time because the colleges weren't open at that time. And so people had to do something for the war effort. We were saving um, metal, uh, tin foil. <laughs> I don't know what they did, but they with the tin foil. My, both of my parents smoked cigarettes, and in the inside of the cigarette package was tin foil. They used to save that, and they'd, they'd collect it. Every grade school, and that might have been high school too, but I was in a grade school, you had a big pile with a fence around it, a barbed wire fence. And every child brought things to school of metal, and you put in that pile, and then the army would come by and pick it up, melt it down to make weapons or whatever. Then we did have victory farms. One of them was uh, across the road from Brantwood Road. All of that area that's underneath the, the, the electric wires that go, that go up Horn Pond Mountain, those were all victory gardens over there. And I think lots of people had different shares of them. Everyone had victory gardens, that is vegetables, <clears throat> so that the professional growers, all that went for the army, uh, for the military, and then you subsisted on your own vegetables and so on that you, that you grew. Every week in school we would take our quarter in and get a stamp, put it in a little book, and when you filled the book you got a war bond. Churches, clubs, Kiwanis clubs, all kinds of organizations, synagogues, would have their communicants make boxes with messages from the church or from the synagogue or from the Kiwanis Club or whatever to say, how you doing? And so it became a personal, kind of a personal nature, which was, I think, pretty remarkable. And that went on all the time. We had boxes around our house all the time. Uh, one of the women, was at the Winton Club, had, uh, they recently, uh, renewed the stories about the Winton Club. They had an auction sale down at the high school. The, the, the auction is, is a great story and, and I really just learned about this in, in doing this research. And uh, they had a list of items that you could that you could uh, bid on but they were in a, in, they were in a they were in a puzzle so you didn't really know what it was. And, but what the money went to was to buy war bonds. But you actually got the things if you, if you wanted to. Now my father bid on and won 24 pounds of butter. But it wasn't butter. It was 24 pound goat. An auction was planned to raise money to purchase a bomber. The bomber will be officially named the town of Winchester, Mass. In order to make the purchase and have the bomber named after the town, 
$175,000 worth of war bonds must be sold at the auction. So more than 100 items were gathered by the Rotary Club uh, to be auctioned off. And another thing you bought was um, a, uh, a lawnmower, a, an automatic lawnmower. Didn't use gasoline, so he bought that. Turned about to, out to be two rabbits. <laughs> rabbits eat lawns and keep the lawns down. But we kept the <laughs> kept the rabbits for for uh, a summer as well. This is a quote from Speed Riggs, the auctioneer. After the auction, I've conducted a lot of war bond auctions since Pearl Harbor. But I can tell you that I have never seen anything like this in as small an audience. The patriotism of Winchester people must be very high, and your town should be very proud of the fact that they have aided the war effort by the purchase of nearly a million and a half dollars in one evening. I shall take great pleasure in telling of Winchester to other audiences that I face in the future in various parts of the country. We were so busy doing things as kids for the war effort. I felt, see, we felt we were in almost like in the Army. Uh, every day you did something for the, mil for, for the thing. You either tended your garden, uh, you took care of all the metal pots and pans, you went on salvage drives, what we call salvage drives. We'd walk around whole neighborhoods, going to every single house saying, do you have something in metal that we can take and put in the yard? And, and we went, as kids, we went roaming every neighborhood constantly. And it wasn't just like once a, uh, once a week, it was like, I mean, more than that, like once a month. You go every single home in your neighborhood asking, usually the housewife, do you, is there anything in your home that we can put for, uh, for the war effort? So you felt as though you were almost conscripted. It, it was a positive feeling. Today, Americans aren't the only ones who call Winchester a home. Seventy years ago, a half a world away, these residents had entirely different experiences on the European front. I'm August Westner, born in Germany in Stuttgart-Hofen, and live in the United States for 46 years. During the war, well, it was very, very simple, you know. The first, the first cleanse I ever remember in World War II was at night. There is a, a little light went across the sky and my parents said there are Englanders as the English people they're flying across. We heard one plane and all of a sudden there were flares coming down. We call it the Christmas I thought they called it the Christmas trees. Because there's one plane went ahead and they dropped flares on about a half a minute or a minute after the bombers came in. And I thought they had that time, you know to get away, get quick into a bunker. And we lived about, oh probably about a quarter mile away from the bunker in case something has happened. You have to think about, it. in the middle of the night, the bombers came. You had to get up at one in the morning, three in the morning, run to the bunker. You couldn't have any light, you know. People were running, crashing together because you couldn't see anything and shouting was going on. I remember one uh, guy was screaming out, we have to do because we got arm. So we have to do that because we got one guy, he meant Hitler, in the bunker, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't uh, uh, speak because it was very close control because people were talking about the war and getting angry. And there were always a couple of Nazis in there. You cannot speak in here because of, of oxygen. When you speak, you use more oxygen. That was the reason. But later on, they bombed in daytime, you know, they didn't have flares anymore. You could see them coming by the hundreds. The whole air was vibrating from the noise of the engine. On going to the kindergarten, there was a little hill going up. And on top of the hill was a, a, a an area where you could drink some water, you know, a well or whatever. You had to, it was connected to the, the to the water line at that time, but in the old time was a well. And we let, you know, we stood there and looked down to the river. And we saw an airplane coming down, you know, from about 
over 500 feet going down, flying very low over that hydro water plant on dropping a bomb. He missed by about 200 yards and you could see a big fountain of water going up and we could look straight out into the guy who was flying that plane. You could see the guys with the goggle. <laughs> he was probably about 200 yards away or less. And then he went up again and left. One plane came later, one single plane. He was slower or I don't know what. And you could see the anti-aircraft gun shooting at it. You know, there were light, white puffs all around the plane. And he got hit and he caught fire and you could see some parachutes coming out. But it was already about probably 20 miles away where you see the little parachutes. We made a Sunday walk with my parents. We walked up to the field and out to a dry lake called the Max Eitze. There were pieces of airplane lying around where their shot went down. But the second bombing, I remember that very, very well. That was in 19, I think it was 1945. Well, we could see the bombers coming in, in, I remember that, you know, there were probably about people counting it. I don't know, there were over 100. I don't know the right number, how many there were. And then they were circling around, and one group went that way, and the other group went that way. And one came down, and they bombed the, the factories in Stuttgart, and bombed Stuttgart too. We were in the bunker, you know. And after a while, when the plane was gone, we could get out and I could see the whole city like a big black torch going up. Smelling, stinking, everything was flying in there, beddings, paper, you name it. You know, there was an updrift. It, it's unbelievable. If you never see anything like that, there's a, a forced fire is a little thing against it. You know, our war started in 1939. I moved to Hemel Hempstead from Harrow, which is about 10 miles from London. And we moved because of the war. And it was in the country. And I think everybody knew we would be bombed. But of course, a lot of children were evacuated from London because it was so unsafe. When the war broke out, I was in London, um, and I was seven years old, almost eight. Uh, the government was extremely efficient in arranging to transport tens of thousands and possibly hundreds of thousands of children out of London to get them to safety, because everyone expected there to be bombing in London and other big cities. So, um, really, without any advance warning, Without being consulted, suddenly we children were just shipped off. It was important to save the children, and a lot of children came over here. So it was a, a time of great upheaval. Yeah, the Winchester was privileged to entertain uh, some English children who were being housed in Winchester uh, during the war and uh, they took part in a broadcast over WRUL. Uh, the children have adapted well in spite of their heartaches. At the luncheon they sang pa patriotic English songs and there were a few tears shed by the assembled Rotarians and extended wishes for an early return home to the children. Uh, the Rotarian magazine, uh, which is a monthly publication, uh, reported in the March 1941 edition uh, on page 49 that the Winchester Mass Rotary Club entertained 13 refugees from Britain and is raising funds for a rolling kitchen for Winchester, England. When we were all put onto trains, um, the government again was very clever, I think, in sending whole schools in a package together to different parts of the country where it was safe or thought it was going to be safe. We were first sent to Kent, and Kent is on the east coast of England, very close to the Channel, and on the other side of the Channel, of course, there's France and Germany, and Germany was sending bombers over to London. So that was a rather silly thing to do. Out of all their clever planning, that was not one of their best moments, I think. 
So we were there for nine months. We were four children. My, I had two older brothers and a little brother. My older brother was 12 at the time, coming up for 13. And the next was about a year and a half old, uh, younger than, than he was. And then, then I was, um, as I said, seven. And my little brother was probably five and a half or six. Um, and amazingly, um, a single couple, I, I always thought of them as being in their 20s, but I've since reflected they must have been older than that. Um, in any case, they didn't have any children. They took on the four of us, which was an amazing, extraordinary thing to do. Um, I saw her again when I was probably in my 50s or 60s. I went to Wales just to wander around the old sites. I'd been there in the interim, but this was another time on my own. And I met her, and she was aged, aged, bent over, crone, who said my name. She loved this in her Welsh accent. And she was a sweetheart, a lovely, lovely woman. And after nine months, uh, we were picked up again without warning, without consultation of any sort, and sent to the other side of the country, to Wales, which is far west of London. Now to us, this seems, it seemed at the time, a long, long train journey. But I do remember arriving in Wales at a town called Carmarthen, a fairly large town. And as we left the rail station and traveled to the center point for, quote, distribution amongst the local residents, um, people were lining the streets and they were all waving and smiling, waving flags and things. And uh, for myself, I was just stunned. I, I just, what is this about? You know, I had no idea people would actually welcome us. But of course, there was high, high patriotism at the time. And I imagine the government had gone to some trouble to send propaganda out to the rest of the country to make a plea, open your hearts and your homes to these little children coming out of big cities that are going to be bombed, especially London had a special appeal. And then they put us all into a church hall. And then the local people came and selected who they would like to have. And uh, that was, as I've often said, a, a cattle market, really. Uh, when you think about it, it's rather intimidating. And uh, I mean, it's not a nice experience to go through, to be up there for choice like that. But my brother, at 12 or almost 13 years old, had been instructed by our parents to keep the four of us together, which it was an appalling responsibility to put on a 12-year-old. We were, I think, probably the last four left there. And of course, we had to be split up. So I was taken to a little tiny house. Uh, Wales is a very old-fashioned country. I was standing on the bed in the little spare room, I guess she had, in my nightie. And she came up to me, and she was, of course, at the same level, and she put her arms around me and hugged me. And not only did I think it open up the, the uh, bewilderment and uncertainty and fear and so on that probably was affecting other people and I had some sort of a shield against that, it opened up that and it was what I needed so badly. And yet when, sometimes when you receive comfort it makes you a little less strong because finally you're able you're able to let down some of your barriers you know so the next day they whipped me out of there because as i understood afterwards she was a lady of what was then called bad repute i think that was the term used so i gathered she was a bit of a loose woman and that wouldn't do at all so i was put in with a, a highly respectable rather boring family they had two little girls so I think my younger brother and I were away for about three and a half years. And uh, my recollection is in that whole time we saw our parents once. Uh, you see, I was 13 at the beginning of the war. Mm -hmm. So you do understand, perhaps you grow up more quickly under those circumstances. When you're living in wartime, a lot of m memories are vivid. I mean, being 
bombed. We were in an area where we had air raid sirens go and air raids. And so at the beginning of the war, we would go in an air raid shelter because of one of the neighbors had one and that it was an air raid shelter in his garden and built underground and he invited any of the neighbors to come to the air raid shelter and we did at the beginning even in the middle of the night and then we got very tired of doing this so we just stayed in bed and hoped we were, it wouldn't be bombed. The bombing didn't start immediately in London so there was this lull and a lot of people were saying oh come on why did you take our children from us there's nothing happening we're not being and naturally they missed their children so terribly and they brought them back. I don't have any records, I don't know what happened, whether those children stayed through the Blitz, if they did stay and they were harmed or killed, what must those parents have felt? Uh, really, I won't say once a night, but in certain areas it would be every night, London would be every night at the beginning of the war. And of course people generally would go down into the underground which is not like your tea here, it was more like the New York or Washington DC the underground where there's this tube of a platform, where the platform is a little tube and the platform. And I didn't experience this personally, but of course I've seen many pictures. People were crammed in like sardines, they would go down there for safety to sleep at night and if they still had children they would take them to. I don't know how they how they did that night after night. And they'd come up and they wouldn't know how much had gone during the night, whether their own home was still there. Behind the house I was staying in, there was a, a high, high hill that verged upon being a mountain, but it was covered in greenery. It wasn't, it wasn't have rocks. It wasn't that kind of mountain. It was just a very high hill. And there was one bomb crater on it. And we, we would look up at it sometimes and you know, it was, it was just there. We got used to it. But how strange when you think about it, it was some bomber who got rid of most of his bombs on London and then got lost or something, went out of his way over to Wales and thought, well, I'll dump this while I'm here or I'll get in trouble when I get home and dropped it. London was really, in some areas, demolished. And I think the royal family did an awful lot to keep morale up. They stayed in England and they could have departed anywhere had they wanted to and they uh, stayed often in London and would always visit the bomb sites the next morning after people had been terribly bombed and lost their families and homes. And of course we read so much about wonderful things like reading about the Queen Elizabeth said we read in the papers, she said, we'll stay in England. The king will not leave England, and I will not leave the king, so we will stay. And just this, this sense, the link basically of a closeness, you, you were so aware of what was going on in England, and you really felt concern and sympathy for them. And the bombed buildings were all over London. And what, what tore at my heart was to see, there were houses, of course, not just the important office buildings and so on, but you would see a wall of maybe several stories, maybe they were apartments, they weren't huge apartment buildings in London there, maybe two or three story. And it's as though somebody had come with a big hatchet and cut off. And there was the little fireplace. And maybe there was even a chair left, you know, you felt, People were just living and momentarily, in moments, it was all gone. The only preparation for the war that I was aware of or remember is that we had to try uh, practice putting on gas masks. We were all issued gas masks which we had to carry at all times. If you went out anywhere, you took your gas mask with you. and. Uh, that became a bit of a nuisance going to school. 
and that was horrifying. I can still feel the suffocating feeling of being inside this monstrous thing and also I think it's probably left me with somewhat of a, a, a fear of being enclosed too much. When I went back, ready to go to grammar school, there was still some danger but it, it, it became rapidly worse. The, uh, toward the end of the war, I don't know the dates now, uh, Germany had as a last gasp effort it was essentially, the, law, the war was essentially lost to them by then, but they were going, naturally enough, they weren't just going to give up. And they have very brilliant engineers and scientists, as you know. And they developed V1s and V2s. They were differentiated by the fact that the V1s, and these were, these were pilotless planes, bombers, very much like today's drones. So I certainly feel very strongly for the people in Syria and so on who are subject to this now because I've been through it. So with the V1s you would have an engine so you'd hear it approaching and the engine would abruptly stop and then everybody got into the habit of looking up. I said a silly thing to do. We could Sometimes we could see it, sometimes not. It could then land anywhere that was not confined so much to London, maybe they were less able to direct it to a, to a small area. So we were all pretty much subject to being hit by those. And there were bombs that were just self-propelled and there were two kinds. One kind, when the engine went off, they fell immediately. Or the next type was the engine would cut and they'd go a few more miles. So you never really knew if you'd be in the line of devastation, shall we say. So every time a jeep passed on the other side of the road and I would hear, I would stop mid-sentence and look up because that's what we'd all been not taught to do it. It was, a, it was an automatic thing we all did when we, meaning the people at home under the bombing, naturally did. We were looking up, couldn't see through the building to the skies. It was just an automatic gesture to look up and listen for when that engine stopped. There was one time when I was cycling home from school, there was a doodle bug overhead. So I got off my bicycle went into the hedgerow and I was lucky because it was the type of bomb that went another few miles because it was directly ahead. But we had a lot of uh, air raid warnings in school and also at home if, if it seemed as though the planes were coming closer we'd go under the dining room table. Now whether that would have saved us at all, I don't know. <laughs> at that point, when it got to be too dangerous with the V1s and the V2s, our parents sent us back to Wales. It, it tore me apart. I had had a taste of home, which was an entirely different environment. We were a much more liberal family. We had such independence we children, and it was just so entirely different. So I can only imagine that when I first went at seven, these things didn't register as fully with me, understandably, after I'd had a taste. And I'd also started a grammar school, so I was, I was enlarging my horizons quite a bit. And I couldn't stop crying. Um, and as I've said, it's, it's probably, a, uh, I probably went into a clinical depression. So I think there was a lot, of course there was a lot of suffering, but I think the spirit was good, tremendously good, amazingly good. And as I've said, I think um, the, American, the English have a lot of humor, always have, uh, which saved the day for many people. We went, you know, we went into kindergarten, they were, um, they always told us, oh yeah, when the British came, come in, 
they kill everybody. I mean, when we saw the first soldiers there, we were afraid, you know, now we get all killed. And after a while, you know, they didn't do anything, they just were hanging around and eat and had a campfire. And we looked out there and they waved us and gave us chocolate. We German, you know, they made it nationalistic. We have to do our own country and they had to find somebody where they can point a finger. It was the French, the Jewish, the gypsies. That's why Germany is behind. We have to get rid of them. When you were told by the German army you have to go there and fight and you know when you be there you never walk out there again. And if you refuse they shoot you. If that's happened in the American army, they just get out. <laughs> Try another way. I just actually read a book, you know, from World War I, when the Prussian people, you know, from Eastern Prussia, they went to France to war. They were idealists, you know, they died for the country. Well, I'm not dying for no country. It's very important, I think, to remember that we're all individuals. Heaven knows now, even DNA will be different between siblings. I mean, there's so much. We are all so complex. We are all, and we are individually so complex. So that adversity struck me, and I survived it very well. I think I have good genes. I think. I am by nature a loner and a thinker, an observer. Now, so I can't speak for the children who were beside me at that era, in that era. But I think it makes sense for today's kids to remember that, that each of you is an individual. Even those living in Europe in the 1940s were often left confused and unaware of the realities of the war and of Hitler's evil. Around the world, people attained information in whatever ways they could, though none were ready for what they discovered. Every week, you'd go, if you went to a movie, and I went to cowboy movies in Concord, New Hampshire, Concord Theater in Concord, New Hampshire, and there would always be a little squib of news, and it was called the eyes and ears of the world. I can remember the graphics coming at you, the screen, and then it would start talking about the war. It showed bombings and all this kind of stuff. So you got that, that was a high visual impact. That was the first time your memory and visual memory connected. We had our ears glued to the radios. We had to visualize in our minds what was going on because you would hear it, but you couldn't see it. No television then. And um, so, I don't know if that it's better or worse to visualize it or imagine it. And sometimes you'd hear bad things like, like that ship that was blown up. And I'm sure that was one of many. And you wondered who all was on it and how many made it or were rescued. It, it was hard for everybody. You weren't there to see it, but you would think about it and visualize it and hope and pray. We did a lot of praying. And you couldn't even ask a question. You know, if you ask a question with that and that, you one of them, you know, they put you right there too, where they go or whatever. You were afraid of the police. Oh my God, if you saw a police on the street, you make it as a kid, you made a detour, get away from him. There were three guys They came at night together and listened to BBC London. And they found out, you know, how the war is going, really, because he couldn't believe what Hitler was saying. I think there was an awareness of the atrocities that were going on, uh, an awareness of the needs of people just to stay alive and a feeling of you would never like this to happen to your own family or to anyone else. Well, there were Jewish people there, you know, what my 
I remember my father were talking about the, a Jewish doctor was the family doctor. All of a sudden he disappeared. He left the country or wherever he, I don't know, we, know, we never found out where he went to. Or there was a, a Jewish merchant, you know, he disappeared. I saw it on te television. In fact, the Holocaust, I saw it. They showed it. They showed live footage on television? Uh, the Holocaust, that's what, how, what, and uh, you know, there's an old saying, saying is believing. But when I saw what, on television, tel I still couldn't believe it. But I thought we were supposed to be civilized people. But when people do things like that, you aren't civilized. It was just an atrocious thing. And, and it, to a kid, it was really pretty frightening. This was revealed around 1944, so I was eight and nine years old. And, and, and I can remember it. Uh, it was in every newspaper and so on, so, and you saw things. So I do remember that. I think we, after it was over, thought, how, how did that actually happen? You know, as you look back on the, the, the scope of it as it got bigger, and thinking, how did these things actually get into motion? I mean, it was so bad. And how, did people not see and understand at the time? You know, we were old enough. You know, at the end of the war, you know, I was 11 or 12, able to think a little bit more about it. Couldn't anybody have done anything to, to stop any of this, keep this wickedness from just growing and growing? When the, at the movies and when it was all over, and the pictures and the, going into the uh, concentration camps, and I, uh, I think there was some hints of what was going on before the end of the war, but nobody really knew how horrible it was until, until I came out, and it still is horrible to think of, isn't it? How did this generation survive it all? And what is it that makes them different from any that came after? Well, there was always pressure. There was always a feeling you could do better, and you wanted to do better. And most of everybody did better. They worked harder, and they put their back and minds into improving. And back then, it was very different. Uh, everybody was focused on the war effort, whether you were kids or whether you were grown-ups. It was all the same, because every family in the country was affected in those days. We cared a lot. We really did. Everybody in Winchester was patriotic and was behind what was going on. And, and, and you could talk to somebody about anything and they all agreed with you because we wanted the war effort to go on. It was a time the country was really united, really all pulling together, wanting the war to be over. Uh, wanting people that we knew and loved to come home. We all were brave because we had to be, and we wanted to be, and you never wanted to show weakness of any kind. But I often think about how we all loved each other in Winchester. Finally, on September 2nd, 1945, the war in the Pacific ended. The United States made the fateful decision to drop two nuclear bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, then left the whole world to recover, to mourn, and to reflect on this terrible tragedy. Well, we woke up one morning and we were told about the bomb being dropped, and you know, I couldn't imagine an atomic bomb. Well, you know, what's an atomic bomb? And the uh, the amount of damage that it did and the fact that we wished that one would never go off in one of our cities because it was just so destructive. Uh, the president didn't want to drop it but felt that he would save a great number of American lives by doing it, which I'm sure he did. Uh, so, you know, I, I can forgive him for that because he saved lives maybe in the long run. But it was frightening to think that we as human beings could develop a device that could wipe out a whole civilization. 
after the testing and all that, everyone realized what devastation this was. And I can remember television shows when I was probably in high school, junior high and high school, of scenes of a bomb had dropped and all of a sudden everything was like living on the moon. And how would life adapt and all that kind of thing. And I think there were a lot of anxieties of kids wondering, gee, what, what's this all about? What's, what's going to happen? But I, I believe the atomic bomb is good and it is bad. One thing is good, it prevents World War III. That's what a lot of people, in fact, that's what prevents war from me, the United States and Russia, the atomic bomb. So it prevented the war. And it's bad because it does do a lot of destruction. It kills a lot of people. So just we hope that nobody uses it against one another. Like Kennedy said, there's no winners. One does against another, it's almost like committing suicide. It was appropriate at the time. To do that today, I would say no. But at that time, I would say yes. But that's because we were at war and we were losing people all over the place. Maybe this would be the end of it. And it was. At least it was for America. After all they had endured, this persevering generation was finally able to celebrate the end of a war that had felt as though it might last forever. To see a human being gaining his freedom is a wonderful thing. To see 10,000 gain their freedom in a matter of two weeks is almost unimaginable. At the end of the war, oh, that was a happy time. Uh, my daughter was just a little baby then. Uh, we tossed her up in the air to celebrate, and it was such a joy to have it all over. Uh, it was a great time. I think everybody was very happy. There was a lot of running around in the streets, everybody shaking hands and smiling. and. Uh, very thankful that it was over. You know, they, there would be marching and the flags would be up and every, everybody was very patriotic. And I think they still are. I was at Times Square during the celebration of the end of the war. Yep, it's very exciting, very exciting. Horns were blowing and people were yelling and screaming and parades and bands and it was fabulous. It was really very exciting. A long time coming. Well, I can remember when the troops came, yes, and there was a feeling of relief, I think, a, a great feeling of relief. And my, uh, the cousin uh, who was a paratrooper came over here, oh, quite a few years ago, and he said, you know, I always feel that we should thank an American every day for what they did for England. Um, I remember my daughter, because she, she was just a wee tot, but she could say a few words. She'd say, Happy VJD. It was Happy VJ Day, but it was Happy VJD. Happy VJD. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny to remember she was just so delighted that her daddy would come home because she would not have remembered him because she was just a baby when he left and he comes back when she's over two years old. So he missed all that wonderful time to see his little daughter grow up. I remember celebrating a VJ Day on a bridge between the United States and Canada in the Fort Kent, Maine. So there was sort of a joint celebration. It was interesting of both the Americans and the, and the Canadians up there. Huh. But everybody certainly was longing for a return to uh, normal times. I mean, it was four or five years that the war lasted, 41 to 45. The E-Day, of course, was the big celebration for England. And I can remember we went to London and saw uh, the King and Queen on the balcony at Buckingham Palace, and the most celebrated person, Winston Churchill, joined them, and it was a wonderful m moment for England. Many of the streets in the whole of Britain 
once there was VE Day or VGA Day, they would close off the street and they would somehow or other build, uh, uh, put together a table, the whole street, and they would cover it with a tablecloth. And all the women would, would cook nice things. And of course there would be balloons and flags and the women, everyone would wear silly hats. So there was that kind of celebration and I was lucky to be able to join in one such because my friends, neighbours were doing that. And I think we essentially, I would say, saved the world in a sense because had Hitler won, you know, it's, it's horrifying to think what the world would have become. Absolutely it had to be won. Absolutely it had to be won. Uh, I, I can't imagine what it, been, what it would have been like if, if we hadn't won the war. It would have been horrible. I don't even want to think about it. Can you imagine Hitler would win the war, what would happen? We would be sitting in Siberia somewhere taking a guard port position. <laughs> it was uh, a difficult time. And we're all very grateful it's over. It's so, it's funny because these, it was so long ago, and yet the memories are still so clear. You know, you realize what a huge, huge impact. Your earlier question of how did it affect you. That, you know, there are many other things, lots of other things that have intervened in the years that you don't remember. But I think being, being brought into the much bigger world at a younger age than you might have been expected to be really kind of gelled it together. And it was, it was an enormous decade. I mean, the 40s were absolutely amazing. But you can't completely lose these things. They stay there. What I always think to myself is I put them in a closet, shut the door, lock the door. But there are times in your life when whatever bad has happened to you, that darn closet door will come open and it'll flood you. Now I, I deal with this, you know, if it's something I have to relive for the moment, so be it. I'll do it and then I'll remember so many things that are good and have been good. Not only in my life, but what I was given internally, which is what counts ultimately. Finally, we asked our citizens for one message that they felt they could give to the generations to come. It's hard, suddenly hard to put this into, into some sentence, you know. That's a good question. But yeah. I would hope that people would sense that we are one world with many different parts, but we are so interlinked now. I mean, we know what's going on halfway around the world the day it happens. And if it could make us understand that each country is full of people who are actually more like us than we think. Well, how important family is, how important it is to be committed to an ideal, which was saving the world from the uh, oppression of Hitler. Um, and stick to your guns. Uh, any, any war is stupid, you know, <laughs> to my opinion. There's no winner. Well, just how fortunate we are to be citizens of the United States, you know, this, this, despite the problems we have. Uh, I can't think of uh, any other country I would want to be a citizen of besides this one. I think they should know the strength of the, the people who went through uh, those war years and um, the resiliency with which, which people uh, handled what they had to handle. Well, I think the, the whole point is when you've lived through a war, you never want to live through another one. People die for what reason? To protect an ideal. Why do we have to protect the ideal? Shouldn't we all have an ideal? Not to destroy things, not to make things bad, but to make things better for now and for the future. You have to let the people live free.